This is Coda Radio, episode 196 for March 14th, 2016. everyone, and welcome to Coder Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show, taking a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and related technologies. This episode is brought to you by our two fine sponsors, DigitalOcean and Linux Academy. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as the show goes on. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our established host on the East Coast, dialing in over the magic of the internet. Why, yes, folks, it is indeed Mr. Dominic. Hello, Michael. Good afternoon, Chris, and a hearty shalom to any of our listeners in Tel Aviv. You know, uh, I won't see you also, not just for shalom, we should also say uh, Happy St. Patrick's Day, because that's going to happen before the next episode as well. So we're just getting it all out of the way. I, I am celebrating this year, Chris. Oh, really? What, what, what yeah. are your plans? What are your plans? I am working and getting a haircut. Oh, okay. It was that. Which Is it the working that's a celebration or the haircut? Well, I'm doing it all drunk, so... Ah, very good, sir. Very good. In the proper Irish tradition, write yes. your hate mail to alan at jupiterbroadcasting.com. <laughs> exactly. Well, Mr. Dominic, coming up on this week's episode of the Coda Radio program, uh, a couple of tidbits came out in the Android N beta. We'll just really quickly pop through those. I just wanted to cover those. And then there's been an elephant in the room for like a decade, and uh, it must be on the mind of some of the audience members, too. Yes, Hybrid. somebody... Somebody almost went rage out on Twitter. I don't know if that was Chris. <laughs> was it Chris? You know what? You know what? We'll talk about that in today's episode. And then towards the end, somebody's been giving out a lot of love. Speaking of Twitter, one of your hosts here has been shining the love light on Did Java. Did say the flashlight? I'm just going to say Java. I won't say more than that. But uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, so. But, you know, before we go into any, any of that, I, I wanted to start. I wanted to warm up, if you will, Mr. Don. Warm it up, baby. Warm it up. Uh, you know, I know you are, in the past, you have been on the show a bit critical of uh, crowdfunding. And uh, we've particularly talked about Kickstarters. But, you know, what we've never talked about are those uh, Valve green lights over there at the uh, Steam. Yes. And I'm wondering if you've, you know, because you and I, we both have a little bit of a... Uh, Secret love for uh, indie gaming. It's like if we could cover some, if we could cover a topic more on this show, that'd be great. But it doesn't really fit into the flow, so we don't talk it about really it. Fit, yeah. uh, but you know, Valve obviously can't keep up with all the uh, onslaught of games that comes in, so they created the green light process. And the hope is that a game will get enough votes to make it into the top 100, where games will have a pretty realistic shot of getting welcome to Steam's gated community. It costs a hundred dollars to submit a game to Greenlight, and the uh, of course Valve says that's like a preventative. Measure to prevent just like people submitting joke titles. It's a really long post, but uh, it looks like it's kind of a bit of a hit and miss process for these green lights, especially when it comes to like them getting funding and actually delivering. It's a pretty hit and miss on the deliveries. There's a couple of key points in here, but this kind of topic. Uh, where you're doing a green light thing where then you get green lit and maybe you can do a little crowdfunding. Maybe Steam is a platform to do that on. Or things like Bounty Source, in the case of the Elementary OS project, which I've been uh, talking uh, to uh, Daniel from Elementary OS about that on our subreddit, just asking how they use Bounty Source to get a little more clarification. And I, you're probably familiar with it, but it's, you know, here's a problem, or here's a thing we want written, or a patch we want to create it, and here's uh, 75 bucks, here's 100 bucks if you do it. And uh, you just go get the, you take the bounty, you submit the code, and right. then the bounty source site takes care of the payment stuff. Uh, what do you? What are your thoughts on things like Greenlight and uh, and then also Bounty Source for raising funding uh, for development of games or open source projects? Do you feel like they're equivalent to Kickstarters, or is this a better way to raise crowdfunding? So I didn't know Greenlight actually gave the developers capital. No, I think what it typically is is once you get into Greenlight, there is either an avenue to get funding or you're more you're more likely to get funding. This article gives into all the specifics. Right. I didn't I didn't really want to go into all of it. Yeah, but. no. I mean, my understanding is it's just a promise that Steam will give you a. a an entry into the store, right? Right, but it's like it's like a basically the way this guy talks about it here is uh, they you know you can show by showing momentum via green light is usually a good avenue to begin funding. Okay, so it, it's just another thing for your pitch deck. But the whole idea is by the crowds are supporting, so sort of like more. But that's why I'm kind of you know it's kind of like the crowds are coming in and voting for something, or in bounty you source know, people are coming in and they're, and they're voting with. In bounty source, you're voting with your money. You're saying come in and work on this code. Here's fifty bucks to do it, or here's five bucks, and then if, you know twenty people put five bucks in, uh, or uh, on green light, you're voting with a thumbs up. 
Uh, and so my, right. my thought is, is like both of these are sort of more crowd-oriented ways to move development forward that feel to me different than Kickstarter. I mean, I have never done anything both either, you know, in terms of development. I'm not a big games guy, um, though I have done game development in the distant past. Um, I have never really participated in Greenlight even as a customer. I don't know. I mean, I love, I know it's not the same thing, but I love the humble bundle system where mm. I can optionally reward financially things that I value. For instance, you know, my machines, my... But those are for completed products. This is, I mean, you know, this is what, right. I'm at, what I'm asking is how in a lot of times people uh, are in a situation where they don't have full-time employment. And if they could just make a little bit of extra money on the side to work on a project, that would be a – and it seems like g- genuinely something like Bounty Source is, uh, is yeah. not a bad tool because no, I, you're paying I, on delivery of completed code, right? It's not like you're kickstarting some, some project that may or may not ever happen. I mean, I like the concept. I, I like that – you know, I love the bounty source concept. Concept, I think that makes a ton of sense. I I have no problem also doing like a pre-sale of a game that's not done if I can try a demo. I'm not totally mm-hmm. against funding things that are in development or even beta builds. Like I'll, I, hey, you know, you, you know, put an obnoxious beta label all over it and uh, let me from time to time, you know, play it. And I'll I mean, s- I've give some feedback. A bunch, a bunch of those like early access team games. Yeah, at yeah. Full retail because you know what? But usually, again, I don't. You know, Chris, we're we're. Uh, Remember demos? Yeah. Like shareware demos? Yeah, where you get like the first three levels or yeah, something. Yeah, like the first level or first three, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And then if you like it, you buy it. Yeah. So I, that's fine. I mean, I don't think... I actually thought that was amazing because what that did was uh, that often got me to buy the game, number one. And towards the end of that era, they got pretty savvy. Like you didn't have to like re- reinstall the shareware. They would just enable the extra levels or like, you right. know, it whatever. Was a client, but they yeah. just... Yeah. Uh, or, you know, like you would just get the CDs and then copy over the extra data from the CDs and you have the rest of the levels. Um, but then uh, towards the very end of that era was when I started getting busy enough to not really have enough time to play the games. Yep. And so instead of needing, you know, I'm not I don't need to pay 60 bucks for a game. I'm only going to play two levels of and then never have time again. I, I could be inclined to pirate that if it was easy enough. But if you just gave me a demo of the first three levels, I'll download that for free, legitimately the way you want me to, uh, you know, and play it, and then I'd be done. And it was a great way to get gaming in without actually having to go all the way in or have to even consider piracy, which nobody wants to do. So it's yeah. it's uh, I thought that was a great era, and you know, one of the reasons I have been backing some of the uh, um, what's the Steam term for the for the uh, early games the. Uh, is it early access, I think? Yeah, or? something like that. Yeah. I've backed a couple of them just simply because they're working on Linux first. Or, you know, it's one of the three platforms they're releasing on day one, and I want to show a Linux purchase. Right. So, that, so that's the kind of thing I do, like on the Humble Bundle. It's how do you want to count your purchase? And I always count it as either Mac or Linux, right? Um, I don't know. I, I guess I, I don't understand. You know, I never would have thought it was green light as a tool for a game developer to go then get a publisher. You know, the see, uh, I think it, what it is is it shows excitement in the community. Right. Okay. So it's almost like see how it's almost like a case or a campaign. We got a million blah blah blah. Right. So one of the things I like in the Red Pepper is pointing out is uh, on Bounty Source, if you commit money to a bounty and it never gets claimed, your money you get your money back, which is kind of nice. Yeah, that makes you sense. You cannot right? get your money back. He says, I don't think that's true, but I think you don't get all of it back or something like that. There might be something in there. But uh, w- uh, if that's the case, see, i got to look into this because I find this bounty source thing to be fascinating, but there's got to be a catch. Like, like if he's saying, like, if they keep your money, that would be a bad, that would be a, that'd be no go. Um, so, anyways, I'm sure maybe some people out in the audience have played around with it. And I've gotten, you know, some interesting information from Daniel, which Elementary OS is a, is a pretty big project, so it's been interesting. And they have like hundreds of dollars for different categories. And it's kind of the other thing that's kind of interesting about it, Mike, when a project is all in on the bounty source thing, is it sort of becomes a roadmap of what features they're looking for. So, Elementary OS is a, you know, I should just pull this up because last time I tried to talk about this, their website was down, so I couldn't uh, actually talk about it. Uh, bounty source. On ele- for, one of the things you notice when you're looking at this, so if you Google Elementary OS bounty source, it's the first result. And, nice. uh, um, if you look at what they're with, so they have six hundred and ten dollars dedicated to uh, Pantheon Mail, which is their rewrite rewrite Geary. Uh, so you can immediately tell that's going to become a pretty important feature to their future operating system. They're committing six hundred and ten dollars to that. Uh, they have five hundred and twenty dollars of GTK Plus patches out. 
They have uh, 315 in bounty towards the Midori browser. You can $215 towards their music player. You can kind of see where their priorities are. You can see also, like, uh, here's some money for their app center. You can see what features they're working on in their app center specifically because that's you can see where they've individually allocated the money. So for right. a semi-private project like Elementary OS, they're very public in in what is essentially their roadmap here. That you could you could grok from this where they're taking their distribution. So it is in some ways a very revealing tool. At the same time, though, uh, it uh, it it really probably helps match expectations because you have a very clear answer for where is feature X at and why don't you have this yet, and are you going to enable feature X? And there's a platform here for the users of the distribution to sort of vote with their wallet. I, and I can see this working for a lot of things like like mail clients or a, like a web browser or all kinds of like really important foundational tools that um, are open source. I just think this, I don't know. So I'm wondering if the audience has experience with this. I'm wondering what you what your take is on funding this way or if you just think this anything but the traditional model of funding is is risky. Is that too modeled? No, I, I think it's interesting. I, again, I don't know much about Greenlight. I don't know. I don't really. You know. I'm not really asking you specifics. I'm asking. I guess because what, what I'm trying to get, what I'm trying to pin you down on, is in the past you've pretty much pooped on any any GoGo or Kickstarter that has right. been. But and and so I'm wondering now when you when you move the model something like Bounty Source where it's delivery upon money upon delivery of goods. Um, does this feel to you? I mean, just that principle right there. Does that feel okay? Does that feel, or are you so sort of like if it's if it's if it if it's coming from your users, that's not the right place to get it. Like that's what I'm trying to get from you is no, where I you draw the line. Sense. I think I think that's wildly different than Kickstarter, though, right? Yeah, I agree. I agree, and I'm wondering if that's what if that, I'm wondering if that's what the difference. I mean, it's was. basically micro consulting if you think about it. Yeah, it kind of is. Like it's like uh, it's like it's like outsourcing lots of lots of little things. Right. It's, it's almost like, oh, I will hire a couple people to do this one small facet of the project. Now, do you think... Yeah. Okay. Hmm. All right. Interesting. I'm going to think more about it, and I'd like to get the audience's feedback, because uh, I also wonder what it does to the overall value and uh, pricing of developer time, but we need to move on from that. It's, it's neither here nor there, and I'd like to hear the audience's feedback before I go much further, because honestly, I don't know if Bounty Source is the right way, but... Uh, I could see. I could even see. I could even see applying versions of that to the Jupiter Broadcasting business model, where we could get, you know, like if the audience really wanted an all HD live stream feed, right? They could put the funding into that specifically, or something like that. I don't know. Right. Right. Well, then again, it could be really pinning pin you down as a business, where you sometimes have the bigger picture and you know how to allocate things for what's coming down the road. I don't know. Speaking of what's coming down the road, Android N. This is something different. Oh, Chris, I, I was getting my ass handed to me. By Android all weekend. Yeah, I noticed from your Twitter feed. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, I, I gathered that. I was thinking we'd do a little time on that. Do you want to talk about that now? Yeah, let's just jump into that before we jump into <clears throat> N. Perfect. Uh, so, for the love of God, I was noticing uh, a lot of tweeting and and uh, well, I don't know if grimacing is <laughs> what is what grousing might be. I don't know what exactly to call it. There, there is. A Okay. Still getting my butt handed to me by weird custom Android layouts. That's one tweet. Something yes. about working with overly complicated custom Android fragments that makes me think people do this on purpose. <laughs> yeah, so, so that is the point I wanted to go over. I firmly believe that this thing I'm working on was made complicated for the explicit and sole purpose of making it difficult for other people to work on. Okay, now that now how do you get there? Because you no, know, who at Google? You're, I'm assuming you're talking about somebody at Google did this. Like for what are you talking no, about? Let's break this down. It's just a piece of code. Oh, I, oh, 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 okay, yeah, okay, yeah. okay. I was going to say, why on earth would they do that? All right, so you think so? So some 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 guy or gal makes this piece of code, and it's just like mental masturbation, ridiculously complicated. Well, it's not even that. It's like very rigid, right? So they they had apparently a spec. And they were like, I'm going to adhere to this spec, and the world will never change. Mm -hmm. Period. End of discussion. Right? Like, the world is... So what you're telling me is the pragmatist coder found the idealist coder's code and tried to adopt it. Because <laughs> you are very pragmatic when it comes to this kind of stuff, my friend. And so, uh, you know, I well, think... Wait, 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 wait. Is it? Okay. Uh-huh. Let's just talk about, like, UI coding for a second. Break it, break it, break I, it down. The, I... Don't think it's an awesome idea to be subclassing, or, or mm. I mean, let me take that back because subclassing obviously is not what I'm talking about. To be writing your own goddamn UI elements, 
if your UI element does not render in Android Studio, yes, you should not be using the visual design tool. I'll give you that. But that's definitely <laughs> no, that's a, a solid warning. point. That's a solid that's a point. Warning, right? Yeah. That it yeah. doesn't render. And you know what? Having that little design tool when I change the XML just to say, oh, that's not what you want, or oh, especially when you're doing these like very picky, very like down to the uh, we have an iOS version and we need to match it exactly because you know everybody mm-hmm. cares. Yeah. No, it, yeah, and that is that is a hell of a headache down the road as uh, UIs change. Well, it, so so you know it puts you in this position of not only are you now maintaining this very strange custom control that maybe it doesn't behave the way it ought to behave in newer or older or specific versions of Android, but anything you do to like start using stock tools and just skinning them would be seen as a regression, right? Mm. So now, so now that's the problem. Uh, I would also like also. Did you, I don't believe that it's a good practice to have a ton of custom controls in any framework. Sure, but in particular in Android because it is such a pain in the ass to work with them. How Especially, do you? How does that? I don't know. How do, I guess I'm trying not to use the word scale, but. How does that work across multiple devices, across multiple versions oh, it of Android? There's a different version for each screen size. Okay, that's what which I thought, and that version. seems that so, seems pretty which, damn unsustainable because you have everything from the Note down to, uh, like the mini phones, like so that some well, of the. Well, here's what it does. It turns what should have been a, you know, ten to fifteen hour project right into a 20 to 40 hour project. But what's really the most egregious about it is there's really, in, in for modern Android development, there's really so many other, so many ways you could do that, that where that wouldn't be a headache. Uh, like I'm well, looking right now in the Android documentation. Yeah. Uh, you know, and they, and they make they make provisions for different screen sizes and tablet mode. And that's essentially, you know. Well, if you're using, right, if you were using, or at least in some way inheriting and not overriding too much Google's tools. Right, yes, exactly. If you're writing your own wonderful little widget, you don't have any of that. Right. So, you know, that becomes really problematic. And a situation like that actually has a lot of hidden complexity. So it's one of those cases where you'll look at, you'll look at the change you want to make and be like, oh, that's not too bad. And then you'll get into it and realize, well, wait a minute, this is going to be different on different size screens, this is going to be different on different versions of Android, and this is going to be different for tablets. Now, granted, tablets kind of sort of don't matter too much, but you know, if it's a requirement, it's a requirement. So you'll end up duplicating work, right? If you're going to keep the existing structure, you're going to end up either refactoring the whole thing, but then if you don't match the visual design you're probably in, you know you're probably going to have that acceptance issue of well wait a minute this used to match iOS and now it doesn't right mm-hmm. um, you know I have to I have to like I'm being a little facetious I don't actually think this was done out of like haha no one else will be able to take over this project from me um, I think this project in particular. Uh, the person who worked on it previous to me, I think, was extremely, extremely pressured to get things done on a timetable. Oh, okay. And that, so, I, I mean, that's everywhere on the project. But mm. this is a case, and, and I wanted to more talk about the general point of like when you're doing Android development, the absolute worst thing you can do is not have a separate Android design from iOS. It is a recipe for failure. If you're a PM, you are setting up your Android devs to always kind of be not only second class, but literally look underperforming compared what about, to iOS. Uh, okay, okay. I mean, I'm, I actually completely agree with you, but I'm just going to just devil's advocate for a sec. What about Google Maps, Google Now, um, Pocket Cast? These are some well, well known, very highly used applications uh-huh. that have almost identical, not exact, but almost identical interfaces. Across the two platforms, and they, they and I would say obviously they all very lean, very material in design. Well, I, I couldn't answer you though if they weren't. I, I actually, I actually think they are separate code bases that they have just worked very are, hard to make them look. They, they at. are they are separate code bases. Yeah, so I guess but, that, I guess yeah. that kind of proves your point. <laughs> so, okay, so there's a couple of things here. Yeah. 
and, and please get ready to write your hate mail. In general, my experience is that it is much easier to do custom widgets on iOS, and it's much easier to make them maintainable. Um, I think that's in part because, you know, the way iOS, I mean, I don't want to get deep into, like, the whole navigation stack on iOS versus, like, the fragments and activities in Android and how that world all is kind of crazy. Oh, oh. Is it, uh, as we record, Mike, what, uh, when's that Apple announcement coming out that everybody expects they're going to announce a small iPhone? Uh, was it tomorrow or the day after? It's yeah, soon. it's, like, really soon. Yeah. And that's, you know what it's probably going to be? Oh, wow, look at that. We already have leaked uh, iPhone 7 images with yeah, new case design. Know. Like, it's all... Yeah. You know, the thing about that, Mike, is uh, this probably going to be the same screen size as the 5S right now, which is updated components, uh, this new phone that they're going to they're gonna announce. And the iPhone 7 is probably going to be the same screen size as the current I, the iPhone. 6. Yeah. Or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so uh, your worst case scenario is one of these phones that they release has a slightly different screen resolution or size, and you have to update just and those. And you know what? That's not that hard. If you're using auto layout or you're doing your layouts in code, that's... I don't, I don't really... But does have... anybody deny that reality anymore? I mean, I know Android fans l would love to say, oh, that's not a big deal, but I don't think anybody actually denies that, that particular type of work that maybe isn't even necessarily recommended, right, but it's sometimes necessary is easier on iOS. I don't think anybody's going to deny that. iOS started that way. So, so, always... so this is interesting, right? Like, iOS used to suck at dealing with screen sizes. And well, no, it was just you have these choices and that's it. <laughs> right, but then you had, like, an if block on every controller, and it was like, oh, and we'll add a couple pixels to the bottom. <laughs> right, yes, yes. Um, and remember, we might slide down this menu or this thing might rotate, and so your UI should expect that this might happen. And Yeah. No, no, it's in portrait where you're wrong. Um <laughs> You know, in a way, it, it, and I don't want to get into a deep, like, discussion about, like, the design behind both, but when I look at, like, how Android deals with activities and fragments, it feels like a very Google, technically correct, but kind of obnoxious way of doing things. Where iOS is like, did the view load? Great. Did it appear? That's different. Great. Is it not appearing? Like, very simple, but also... You know, iOS was playing from behind with not being able to deal with different screen sizes and storyboards and right. uh, even before the nibs. Now, auto layout, basically, if you know what you're doing, is not a big deal, right? It's uh, occasionally if you have some weird custom control or you have a really, really picky designer, you might spend like an hour tweaking one or two elements, but it's not, you know, you're not going to end up in this crazy place where I sometimes find, and this is where it falls apart, right? Android, if you're using Google's controls, if you're following material, you can slap together a great-looking layout in less than an hour. Mm. Once you deviate from that, you are going to start having more and more problems, mm. is what I find. Um, now, devil's advocate in defense of Google, maybe, um, you know, maybe it should just be like, hey, you shouldn't be doing controls that are meant to copy an iOS app. Right? Fair enough. Um, but don't, I mean, Chris, let me ask you this. Don't you think that it's, you know, we have Android N coming out and there hasn't been a whole lot changed to the Google layout tools. Mm, true. And while I understand, and I actually like in, in the most basic cases, in the 90% cases, I think the way Android handles layouts is more efficient for me. I can get it done faster. Mm -hmm than having to deal with the visual storyboard mm -hmm. tool. Mm -hmm. But in those really weird, complex cases, or when I have somebody's crazy control that I need to render in, um, it, it kind of falls apart. And I don't know, and I don't want to denigrate Android for what I just think was a poor job done by someone else, right? Like that's, you know, it, and, and there is a devil's advocate here, you know, the work was accepted previously, so maybe maybe it wasn't such a poor job. Maybe it was just a short-sighted job, right? Don't you think that there should be some kind of mechanism to, at the very least, like let me know where all these views are on, on the Android ah. screen, like which one is actually accepting the click right now, <laughs> right? Because Xcode has that. It's a stupid little thing, and it it's like a preview thing in Xcode, and I can see, okay, that view took the click. 
or Android, I have no... And that's literally what I've been struggling with since like 7.30 this morning, is I got my layout problem fixed by you want my super high-tech hack on my Ubuntu machine. I took out all the custom controls. I cut them out, put them in G-Edit, rendered the thing in the designer without it, put the new control I needed, clipped it using the visual tool to where I wanted it to clip, and then I put all the custom controls back in, copy-paste into the XML. Super high-tech. took me three days to figure that out hmm. um, because that's obviously horrible, but it worked. You now know, I'm going to go, go ahead. So uh, if you were coming to me, boy, this is funny. I was just like, I was thinking if you came to me as a client and you were submitting this to a, a pro, as a problem to me, it's funny, you know, two things jump out at me um, about this particular problem. Right. Is the first thing that jumps out at me is, this seemed was a really weird thing that occurred to me, but I guess I want to explore this a little more, is it sounds like it's, it's, it's so weird there is this huge disconnect between the machine you are creating the application on and then the machines that you have to run the application on. Oh, and it, yeah. And if, 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 I were, if I were to come, you know, from outer space and land on this planet today and give IT consulting, I would say, well, why aren't you just developing on those phones? I mean, why aren't you, you know, creating right there on the phone like, or on the tablet or, you know, in this case, the, the Pixel N or whatever they call it, the, the, the I Pixel. Mean, I mean, so that's interesting. <laughs> That's, I mean, that's just an aside. That was just an aside yeah. observation. Well, I mean, what I, I think what my my main point was is there is this there is just this weird disconnect and this almost inability for you to set your expectations. And that was actually the key thing I was getting to is right. as a developer, it is that is super demotivating because uh, you're sitting there going, I really I don't know how I'm going to know. You know, if I don't know, if I can't set my expectations, that is a hard thing to continue to push through, even if at a low level. And that's sort of what I, that's that is sort of a difficult thing that I take away from it. Uh, and you know, Mike, looking at the new stuff in N, there are new developer APIs and tools coming out. I know. I mean, it's not going to matter. But yeah. Well, now let me ask you this. What if, over time, all of this older hardware just begins, you know, the carriers, the carriers start right. pushing to get it replaced, and pretty soon right. 5.0 is the minimum, maybe 5.1, really. Ooh, uh, that seems like a distant future. Let, let, let me throw some numbers. I, at you. I think the smartphone industry could move. Because here's what you have a two-hour, right. you have a two-year churn. So we are, we've got to be near that bottom, that bottom uh, free f churn by now. And the bottom end phones are well, hmm, yeah, we're not four, quite four. there. Yeah, there. I, mean, yeah. I, I mean, I can tell you that, like for back points, I think it's like eighty percent four four and. In terms of manufacturer, it's like seventy five percent Samsung. <laughs> it's hmm. it's pretty, and it's like all the S three or whatever the four four version is. Yeah, it's pretty. Which is also an interesting problem on Android is that, in in theory, you have all this device compatibility work you need to do, but in practice, you could probably get away with just you know focusing on four four and Samsung. <laughs> yes, right. um, except for all those edge cases that it would be squeaky I mean, wheels. You shouldn't, but it, it, it's a really weird, like, oh, I had to do this for HTC, and oh, I have two users who have HTC phones. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, okay. So, uh, boy, I'd love, you know what, just before we go on to the end stuff, I would love to live in a world where everybody just has Nexus phones. If it was Nexus phones and iPhones. Well, you could get that Project Fi deal, where it's 150 bucks off the phone. Yeah, I'm not, something's telling me not to jump on that particular bandwagon. Although I do get reports from listeners out there that are trying it. But uh, I don't, uh, I don't know where to draw the line. Like I was also thinking, if Google Fiber came into my neighborhood and offered me a gigabit, that would be substantially beneficial for the business. But it would be, I, I just substantially creepy as well. Yeah, I would like to yeah. have very clear. I would like to know very clearly what the monitoring is happening on those lines. Yeah, I, I would be concerned for sure. <laughs> That's a weird thing. See, that is a weird thing. So well, I'm not. Let me ask you this. I'm not huge on Fi. You're currently using an iPhone as your day-to-day, -day, right? Uh-huh, yeah, 6S. So am I. I have that weird T-Mobile thing where I can just go get a new phone <laughs> because I want to. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm kind of considering doing it. But, you know, I'm looking at the 5X. That kind of seems like a downgrade from the 6S, right? Definitely, yeah. Um, I'm looking at, you know, I, I just... My love of Samsung is well-documented, so we don't need to go there. 
Uh, I like the HTC, but the T-Mobile Store by me doesn't have one, and I definitely worry that HTC is you know about to commit seppuku. So, I, like, what is the Android phone to buy right now? Well, you got the uh, S7 that just came out, and then there's going to be a couple more phones popping out very soon. Okay. If I don't want Samsung, what is the Android phone to buy right now? The uh, 6P. Oh, the Huawei one? Mm-hmm. I've never seen one of those in the wild, though. I worry about, like, the blind order aspect. Mm, Chase has one. It seems pretty nice. It's big, though. It is big. Yeah, see, I don't know if I want something quite so big. Uh, 6P as what you know. I think I probably just going back to the fiber thing. I probably would get it. Maybe look at VPNs. Uh, uh, so yeah. I, uh, well, see, I kind of am sitting. I am kind of. I looked at. Uh, I read a really good. Um, boy, who who was it? Uh, an Antec article that did sort of make me biased for the year. Uh, where they basically said, you know, the, the now the generation of Samsung processors that are coming out, the Snapdragon or, and the Snapdragons and the Onyx or whatever they call it, these are all pretty good. But the, the Snapdragons from uh, who, who who is it that makes the Snapdragon? Um, Qualcomm or whoever? Nvidia. Or the, no, 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 no. Nvidia no. makes the Tegra. The Tegra uh, right. Anyways, the the iPhone 6s has beat all of the uh, latest batch of smartphones except for maybe the very last like they just the last the generation of cpus just wasn't that great but now now the android now they're actually you know they're they're stepping up i thought the a8 chip from apple was actually like beating all of the android chips qualcomm yeah yeah right flatly although does it matter i mean so this is like i don't do anything on my phone honestly i don't like this i get exhausted right which Android? The problem is there's always a better Android phone coming out. Literally, there's always a better one yeah, coming out. And it's just well, exhausting. I feel like a month later yeah. that I got ripped off yeah. whenever I bought it. And you know what? I, and yeah. The lessons learned, the Nexus phones are the good long-term bet. If you're, if, you're a, if you're a technical user, you know, this Android N beta is out. If you want to try it, you could load it on it. You could load it on a Nexus phone right now. If you want to do Project Fi, well, you'd, you'd have to have like a certain, I don't know which phones, but, you know, you could do that. There's... Right. There's just a lot of advantages to do a Nexus phone, and as much as I like the whiz bang features of the Samsung, you know, I bought the S6. I thought it was a mm-hmm. pretty good phone, and then the problem is, is at least in the time that I used it, towards the very end, they had they had they had a couple of really good updates. <clears throat> but by then, I was so disenfranchised with the phone, and I got the, I got the success, and I was I was I was I was never going back. The performance was just remarkably different. Uh, so I, I just, for me, I, I thought, you know, I'm going to wait this generation out. But if I was going right. to jump in right now, I'd have to go Nexus. I'd consider, I honestly would consider the 5X uh, because it is a good value phone. And if you are comfortable with a phone that's, a, you know, I mean, like that, that level phone, it's slightly better than the last five was. So when you say performance, because I, I think there's something interesting there I think we should dig into. What do you mean? Do you mean like app performance? Do you mean just like menu performance what, what what exactly are you seeing that's not performant on your android device uh well you know i suppose i i mostly have experience currently on the nexus 5 and on the oh, well that's a i mean that's a pretty dated phone yeah and on the uh, on the um samsung s6 edge right. <clears throat> which is you know it's a pretty nice phone um but i yeah uh and also interestingly enough now on the uh on the Nvidia Shield, I have that gaming console. They've been updating that too, uh, which is actually a pretty nice little uh, little console. Uh, you know what, Mike? Before I tell you, uh, before we get into that, why don't we take a moment and thank Linux hey, Academy, wait. our first sponsor, LinuxAcademy.com/coders. Go over to LinuxAcademy.com/coders to support this show and get yourself a discount on a platform built around educating people on Linux, open source technology, and all of the stack therein. All the stuff that runs on top of Linux, or say AWS. Like the Red Hat stuff. If you want to get into the Red Hat certified courses, if you want to get into one of the most respected certifications in the industry, Linux Academy has the best courseware on that. Seven plus distros for the courseware you do go into. You get to choose which one you want, and they they adjust right there. Boom, 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 boom. Oh, okay, yep, Debian, you got it. Oh, Red Hat, yeah, we got that. And the virtual machines spin up, and they match that. Two thousand three hundred and twenty-eight videos where you can get hands-on training experience and instructor help is available when you need it scenario-based labs to make you feel like you've really worked in production which gives you that confidence and graded server exercises so you can see how you're doing while you go graded server exercises are nice and they're also really really a good way to make sure you're learning the material and not just learning the test they have ruby they have android development they have mike's favorite php python 
OpenStack, which we don't talk much about these days because it's become so kind of like back-end infrastructure stuff that it doesn't really get discussed. And, of course, the Android, like I said. In-depth resources are available and downloadable. They have a great, great note system where you can take notes as you go along. Practice exams. Enhanced learning plans. If this is... If you have limited time like a lot of us do, this is a nice feature. They also have an availability selector which generates some courseware. And also... <clears throat> They have nuggets that are just like two minutes long, sometimes 60 minutes long, and you can just deep dive into a single course. That's like perfect for when you just have a little bit of time and still want to get some value. Also, if you are in a larger business, they have pipelines for Linux Academy Enterprise. Linux Academy Enterprise is a feature set they've been expanding upon this year in a big way. So if you're in a large group of people, they have also for just a small group, they have different plans as well. But for a company... This could be a great resource. And Linux Academy Enterprise is getting better and better all the time. So go to linuxacademy.com slash coders. And a big thank you to Linux Academy for sponsoring the Coder Radio Program. Okay, Mike. So when I say performance, I generally mean, <clears throat> in the case of the Nexus 5, where I found performance to be inadequate was in the camera application. But also, uh, and I, I, I honestly feel like I can, I can feel the way the UI renders. It doesn't always track the finger 100%. It's not quite as responsive on iOS. To me, it feels like the Android UI is being projected on the screen by a little tiny micro projector in the screen, and it's drawing each line on the screen as fast as that little projector can. And on iOS, it feels like the menu is superimposed on top of an OpenGL globe, and the camera is hovering above that OpenGL globe. And when I move the menu, that, that is moving that entire canvas that the camera is watching, and it glides, and it's smooth, and it goes at 60 frames per second. And I don't mean to be one of those guys, but I honestly feel like I can, I can visually perceive the difference. And when I, when, I am, when I am in a situation where I need my phone to respond exactly as I expect, that makes a huge difference to me. And so in that area, the Nexus 5 never really lived up to my expectations. And that could also apply to the S6. The S6, however, had some additional issues. Samsung eventually has mostly patched out, but primarily it shipped with 5.0 that had a horrendous memory issue. Horrendous memory issue. And it caused yeah. things like the fingerprint scanner to crash on me so I couldn't unlock my phone. It caused the phone dialer to prevent me from being able to answer calls. It, and then the UI would be very leggy if I opened Chrome. I would have to reboot the phone afterwards. After a couple of updates, they didn't actually, astoundingly, they didn't actually completely correct it. They got to the point where if I restarted the phone every 24 hours, I wouldn't have any issues during the day. But if I forgot to reboot my phone, it would get me, like, right in the middle of something kind of important. Um, so um, after, like, three updates, that was never really fully resolved for me. And that was when I was like, God, I really went all in on this. This was, you know, this was the big, uh, this was the big phone of 2015, and, or one of them. And I, I really, I liked some things about it, and I was impressed with some things about how Samsung, ex you know, presented an Android experience. <clears throat> But at the end, I was left frustrated with slow updates that result that were needed to resolve major problems, and uh, I also felt like a lot of the issues get a pass. People weren't weren't talking about them like they do on on the iPhone. Like when there's a problem uh, where something's changing or functionality is getting removed or something doesn't work the way it was advertised, there's five posts on The Verge about it, Walt Mossberg does two podcasts about it, and the Engadget runs a, a live blog about the issue until it's resolved. When it happens on an Android device, nobody's talking about it. Like uh, uh, my HTC One, which was a beautifully built Android phone with <clears throat> gorgeous sound system. Again, another, another tier one Android phone that I, because I wanted a good experience, I wanted to give the operating system as much horsepower, but as a father of young children, I wanted a great camera. And the HTC One was advertised as one of those things. And the HTC One was so close. Older Android kind of held it down. But the thing that really got it was the purple haze. The purple haze in the camera that I had that I couldn't find anybody talking about for months and months and months. Six months into having that phone, people started talking about it. And finally, it became such an issue that HTC started doing warranty repairs. Of course, they jerked people around. They jerked Chase around so much with his HTC One that I didn't even bother. Not to mention, it meant having to be without my smartphone for two weeks. And nobody was, I mean, if it was an iPhone, it would have been, it would have been Cameragate. 
And so as towards the end of my S6 run, I thought to myself, well, uh, Rikai, who had my HTC One, had, that phone had finally died, and I thought, well, he needs a phone, and I am, I am really burning out on Android, and I'm not impressed with any of the benchmarks on any of the shipping phones right now. And the 6S Plus, with a 4K optically image-stabilized camera, and a two-day battery life, and a very fast processor with a great app ecosystem... I thought, yeah, okay, I'll give it a shot. And uh, I've been very impressed. I've been extremely impressed with it, so much so that I just thought, you know what I'm going to do is I'm just going to wait until maybe end devices are shipping, and then I'll take a look at what's in the field and maybe switch back. It's sort of been my take, because it's just been so, disappointing. Right, so you're just holding off basically for the next generation of devices. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think until everything is USB-C and uh, fingerprint readers are on everything, I, I'm not interested. Lightning and and um, uh, what do they call it? Touch ID is uh, great. So not only not only does it charge super fast, which this is, is something nice, yeah. people don't talk about. But if you have like a two amp or greater uh, uh, lightning charger, man, the six I can I can get I can uh, I can charge that thing up on on. Uh, so I have a DC charger that's like a like a higher amperage charger. Um, uh, Twenty five minutes, man. I can almost get that thing up to eighty percent. Um, it takes a little bit longer to get the rest. And then, and then like right now, it's been off the charger all day. I, str- I streamed audio, uh, and on the way, so I drove for 45 minutes into work today. I've been messaging all morning. I have 94% battery on my phone right now. Nice. And it's like how, so yeah. that is, I don't care what the OS is. I'm talking, those are features of the hardware device that I want now. Um, it's not perfect, but it's, uh, I don't know, I, I, it's, the performance is pretty reliable. It's pretty consistent, I would say. I very rarely have to ever have to worry about restarting or anything like that. So, yeah, Mr. Dominic, that was, uh, that was sort of a tangential, tangential way to answer your question. But uh, how, you uh, are obviously, as developing for uh, Android, are you back on using Android as your daily driver? I'm not. I'm still running the 6S, but I, like I said, I'm thinking of uh, just taking one of my upgrades and switching to Android. I'm just having a hard time finding a phone. So, oh, right, yeah, okay, one. right. Yep. So is your what is, is your impression of the 6S bad? Why are you switching? Uh, it's not bad. It's just kind of boring. It is boring. Yeah, boy, is right. it. Yeah, I'll give you that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, that is a thing. It is. There's not, you know, until next, until the next phone, there's not much going on. Until the next, and then when the next OS comes out, you know, it's you're, you're to really enjoy it, you probably don't need to be on the next phone. Um, right. Right. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's funny. It's like I do get bored with it, and uh, for some reason, I think if you're a geek, there's a lot more toys on Android, and for some reason that appeals to me. But I just when I but then when I have all the downsides, I, what I remember is well, I do need this primarily to be a really solid communications device that has good battery life, and I need something that takes good pictures because I don't have a regular camera. Uh, and for me, also the 4K video that I've been able to shoot with this thing for uh, video on location. Uh, I've been. I have showed it to people, and they. Ha- I asked if they could tell it was a camera phone. They had no idea. Uh, in fact, um, somebody pointed out I did a pan on it, and the optical image stabilization really did work. And they they thought maybe it was on a stabilizer. I mean, it was it's not. It's not. It's not like perfect, but it really is pretty good. So hmm, yeah. So. Not to go on. All right, Chris. Let, let's throw down the gauntlet because you know there's been too much agreement and too much of a love fest here. You ready? I hear you have a beef with hybrid development. Oh, well, I, I have definitely, uh, over the years, I have observed pushback from, uh, from the audience when we talk about hybrid development. Right. Uh, and a lot of times it seems to be considered illegitimate. Like, a, like it seems to be, the elephant in the room seems to be it's a cop-out, or it's the easy way out, or it's uh, the point-and-click solution. And, you know, a lot of pushback uh, from on during the Linux Action Show days when we would cover tools like Real Basic, and just tons of, tons okay, of pushback. Okay, hang on. I know, I know, Real I know, I know, but damn thing. You, I know. You can't Every generation, there. no, hold on, I'm getting there. Okay. Every generation, like, there is something like this, where it... it yeah, the, the Real what, Basic doesn't count. No, I mean, what I'm trying to get to is that essential meme, that pushback, that, that momentum, feels like that has been with us for generations now. And there's different tools at different times for different legitimate reasons that people have on both sides of the argument. Okay. And, and that's all. That's the only comparison I'm making. Because it feels like, because to me, having been doing this for, this is crazy, Mike. Are you ready for this? 
have, well, having, produ- have, having podcasted now for over 10 years, <laughs> can you believe that? Uh, I definitely have noticed that this is a rolling momentum that seems to be constantly there. It's an elephant in the room that is always there that hybrid development is a, the road to disaster. Eventually, you'll bail. And, and there was a post on... Huh? And it's going to kill you. Yeah, there was a post on Medium where he says, your hybrid app is going to kill you. And I've just highlighted a couple of takeaway points where I thought he vocalized this feeling that I felt for like a decade now. He says, your hybrid app might work for different cases. And he says, like, you know, web apps and stuff like that. Especially, and this is the, this is the, this is, this sums up the, the tone of this elephant so well. A hybrid application might work dot, 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 especially when the app doesn't really do anything useful. And then he goes, why do hybrid apps spiral into death cycles? Every hybrid app starts off with the best intentions. Armed with all of the success stats on hybrid apps, your manager dumped on you, which you know to be complete crap. You launch your editor, and you code away. In the beginning, things are good. Your first set of features seems to be coming along nicely. And then it happens. You get your first request to do something that isn't supported on Android, but is supported on iOS. What do you do? Naturally, you add your first, and a long list of them to come, conditional statement to do a feature A for iOS and do feature B for Android. A week later, you realize that your code now contains so many of these conditional statements that you're beginning to wonder if you should split your code into an iOS and Android code base so you don't have to keep adding conditionals. (laughs) It's alive! It's alive! Sorry. And then, when you take into the... When you take into account the sacrifices you make in terms of performance and features that users expect, the impact of choosing hybrid is even more costly. When users really want to use an app that is slow and unresponsive, of course not. If you're an iOS user, do you want to use an app that looks like an Android app? Of course not. Are you you a monster? if, (laughs) If you haven't started that hybrid app, I suggest you really think long and hard before starting one. There is really a reason. There is probably a real reason that companies like Facebook have abandoned their reliance on a hybrid strategy. Wow. Well, in defense of all Victorian English mad scientists everywhere, d- d- damn! Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, I burn! Inappropriate? And yeah. I thought he was just going to say that hybrid developers are morally bankrupt. I thought he was like, right there! Yeah, like, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, that, that so perfectly uh, summed up what this feeling that I felt, this pushback for all these years. And, um... I'm wondering if you've perceived the same thing and what your thoughts are on it. Now, I, because I am maybe in a position where I get a megaphone of it or whatever you call it, like a, you know, like a, like it gets funneled to me because I'm sitting there talking about it on air over the years. And so I get the feedback. Maybe I'm getting hyper exposed to it. All right. So I've had, and I think during the history of this show, in fact, I've had a little bit of a change of heart. And when Mm -hmm. I say a little bit of a change of heart, it's a John Kerry style flip flop. Yeah. Um, It's, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, in a world where I can spend an unlimited amount of time in peop- other people's money developing software, and there's no such thing as an opportunity cost or you know a budget, I absolutely think everything should be native. In the real world, that's super not tenable, right? <laughs> like that, that is just not going to happen. Now, let's just set up a few, a few stipulations here to your side. If your client, customer, employer, or your company has an unlimited budget or a budget that's so big that it simply doesn't matter that you need two separate code bases, two separate developers in most cases, and two separate, remember, two separate apps to maintain going forward, Mm -hmm. then awesome, go for it. That is obviously the right thing to do because you know what? You will 100% get the best experience out out of two native apps. But if you're you know, everybody else in the world, which I, I, I really think is everybody, your boss, employer, client, whatever, is not going to allow you to, you know, spend an unlimited amount of money, right? You know, I, uh, yes, you're right. Yeah. M- Mike, I realized, uh, if you look at it now, too, today's, oh boy, this is, I, don't, I hate to answer this, like, but today's hybrid application and strategy could be completely different than the hybrid strategies of the past, too. Um, so kind of like we were talking about earlier in the show, uh, when you were talking about Android and iOS development, it, it, right. you can you can you can still share lots of common code, but also you can like in your case right now, you're custom designing things for Android specifically. 
So there's a bit of a balance depending on the needs of the application. Yeah, and I, th- I think, you know, hybrid, in particular phone gap, gets a bad rap. A lot of it deserved. Yeah. But yeah. also because phone gap in particular yeah. was a way, and, and I, I don't want to hit this too hard, but there definitely was a trend of, like, company internal web developers. To be like, no, you don't need to bring in a contractor. No, 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 we got this. And basically just make a single-page web application in the phone gap wrapper and not actually take advantage of any of the, like, native tie-ins. Mm-hmm. Um, which in itself is problematic. So I, uh, I'm going to pause you there because I know you got to run at the top of the hour, and I have a follow up question. Get it out of here about uh, your Ubuntu usage. Before we go there, uh, I'm going to mention DigitalOcean. So everybody go to DigitalOcean.com and use the promo code Coder Digital. You'll get a ten dollar credit. You can spin up a rig in like less than fifty five seconds. Five dollars a month, so you get you can try it two months for free. And they're all SSD drives. And they have different pricing plans. The base one starts at 512 megabytes of RAM, the blazing fast CPU, and a terabyte of transfer with a 20 gigabyte SSD, all for $5 a month. They have different images you can deploy to get up and running right away, so you don't have to worry about setting up the underlying Linux or FreeBSD OS. You can just get it deployed with Nginx and whatever else you might maybe. Like for me, I have, I have one that I use. It's Nginx, Postgres, Docker. Good to go. Ubuntu 14.04. Deploy that. Pretty much done. I'm up in minutes. I love that one. Uh, and there's so many great applications, like when I just want to do some testing, to deploy the Docker image is takes seconds, and to deploy the Ubuntu base image takes another few seconds, so it's a couple of minutes, and I'm up and working. They have a great interface, too, so it makes navigating all of it really simple and straightforward. An API that they, in it, they are really, really serious about. I think they're on version 2 now. I'm not sure, but it's really smooth. Tons of good, good, really, like, Convenient applications, like, uh, I don't know if Mike, uh, he'll tell us, but if he's still on Ubuntu, they have a, a menu applet that you just snap right into your uh, Ubuntu bar, right-click on that thing, control your uh, droplets like a boost. They got the same thing for all those other operating systems, too. That's just people taking advantage of that really nice, straightforward API. So go to DigitalOcean.com, use the promo code CODER, DIGITAL, and go try them out. Spin up a rig in less than 55 seconds. They got data centers all over the world, too. New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, London, Toronto, Germany. So you can get local. They got several over in San Francisco and New York. So sometimes I got some over in the New Yorks, but most of them are hanging in San Fran. Real nice on the West Coast style. DigitalOcean.com. Use the promo code Coder Digital And a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the Coder Radio Program. So, Mike, I wanted to just, before we run for the week... See how your Ubuntu usage is going. Have you curtailed? Are you back uh, on the Mac full time? Are you using? No, no, not at all. I, in fact, I was working all weekend on Ubuntu. How did it go? Is this is it okay? Yeah, it went hey. fairly. Hey, um, you know, one, I, little things here and there. I still want to tweak. Like uh, the fonts that I'm getting in IntelliJ or Android Studio are not awesome. I feel like they're a little thin mm. in terms of like the thickness of the characters. Mm-hmm. So I may actually go like get some open source fonts that are different. Yeah, the fonts thing is, uh, that's one of the things I often tweak on my Arch desktop, too. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, there's, like, the theme pack, I, there, the theme pack, the font pack that I use, like, oh, what is it? Rika, if you're listening, maybe, it's, like, Infinality fonts or something like that. I, I can't remember the name of it. It's something like that. And I, uh, I always just go, I end up always loading that because it just... Just makes it a little easier it just on the makes eyes, it Mike. A little easier to work with, yeah. Yep. I, I'm probably because you, as you know, for months and months and months, I've been due for a hardware upgrade that I haven't done. <laughs> um, I'm almost certainly not going to get a Mac. Hmm. So we, we and it's unfortunate because today Dell is running a uh, 31.4 percent off of their XPS 13s. Oh. Yeah, but I can't do it today, sadly. <laughs> yeah. So uh, there's the font pack, yeah, in Finality or whatever. Yeah. And you might be able to get that on Ubuntu, I would imagine. I really like the way it looks. Yeah, I, I like it. I mean, I'm starting to tweak some things. Uh, I'm not sure that Unity is really right for me. I'm still having performance mm. issues with the, the Dash. Mm. But it, there are a couple applications that I miss from Mac, but I might just write replacements because mm. I can do that. There is. So. You might try out uh, if you can dig it. If you can dig away to, I'm sure. I'm sure. Probably even just be in the Ubuntu App Store or, or whatever you call it. That's but, garbage, by the way. Yeah, like, AppGrid yeah, is out there. It's at least tolerable, uh, and it's a. It's also sort of an app store. Um, but uh, uh, Synapse is a launcher. It's, it's much like. Um, um, uh, what is the uh, there's you know there's launchers on uh, Quicksilver it's much like Quicksilver on the right. Mac 
uh, and it's called Synapse. And so I actually like the Unity launcher, but again, this is not awesome hardware that I'm running it on either. Yeah, that's it's true, yeah. very slow. I imagine if I had oh, by the way. There yeah. are programs out there, like, it might just be called Unity Tweak. I have, it's been a while since I've used Unity. But I you, have Unity Tweak. Yep. You can go in there and turn off the blur on your dash. Oh, really? Yeah, and that, uh, that, that Gaussian oh. blur that it does there uh, on older hardware is enough to slow sure. it down. And you just turn that off, and it, it, you don't need it blurred. And then it'll, it should pop up faster. I'm, I'm at the point where I actually prefer working on the Linux rig. Really? Yeah. That's nice. Do you find it to be a consistent performance? You know, I find it, and again, it's a little unfair because I don't, you know, I don't know how demanding I am on the Linux box versus how I am on the Mac. I tend to just like go balls out on the Mac and run everything at once, <laughs> and then I see some beach balls. And Xcode itself is horrible, so you know, problems. I, I, I think it's going to be hard for me to tell really which OS performs better in any kind of fair sense until I have an equivalent uh, Linux rig to my to my MacBook. Although this is not a new MacBook, right? So the other thing is it's just a better spec machine. Right, sure. Yeah. Because it it is uh, just higher end. I know for me, when yeah. I when I sit down at the Mac, what I, I I find the file manager to be very lacking. And even though I know the terminal is bash, for some reason it it feels well, it feels like they really haven't done anything with it since the first public beta of OS X. It's just like the shape of it's weird, and it just it's just a, not a good terminal. And I know you can replace it, but like, what would it take to just put a decent terminal with the OS? Uh, and so the, those things I find to be sort of really kind of choice on the Linux desktop. So if you spend a lot of time in the terminal, in a text editor, in your web browser, and in a in in the file manager. Those are just better applications on the Linux desktop to begin with. And then there's, you know, there's other there's other weird things. You know, it's funny. Like to me, the the Mac UI is uh, it's been around for so long that I I don't that isn't that that doesn't shell shock me. Even though if you think about it, it's really a weird beast with with like where you could close the window, but the applications themselves are still are still running in the background. Yeah. And all and, yeah. and all that that's all like and and the 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 menu bars being up at the top of the screen and not attached to the application. That's really weird. But it's just been around since the 80s, so we just don't... Uh, yeah, do so we're just used to it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, one thing I will say is Unity is very Mac-esque, right? You think I mean, so, when, yeah. When you, yeah. When you get right down to it. The, 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 the yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, right, yep, yep. Yeah, I mean, there, don't get me wrong, there are a bunch of little bugs that are kind of obnoxious. Um, for instance, I constantly set Chrome as my default browser, uh -huh. and I restart it, the computer, yep. and it forgets every time. Yeah, that drives I, me crazy. Don't know why. There, uh, There is also an application, might be, I can't remember... Uh, that allows you to actually change that, but yeah. yeah, on some on some modern desktop environments, it's not an issue. And what I can what I must figure is there has been a way you set that now with GTK desktops that Chrome is using that Unity just doesn't. It's so old it doesn't. That that's what I'm noticing. Like when I try to download like Linux apps, they don't seem to work super awesome, mm -hmm. but people seem to like them and yeah. say that they work. And my assumption is it's because. Uh, the version of GTK in Unity is just really old. So the thing of you know the big difference because uh, I've been uh, I've been using Ubuntu a lot recently on a new laptop uh, on the uh, Apollo, and the big difference with Ubuntu is you actually go out and download Debs and stuff or get good PPAs. And with Arch, um, you, if it's it's in the AUR and it, almost everything is in the AUR, and you just do a command on the command line, it goes out and fetches it from GitHub or wherever it needs to get it, and builds it on your system at that moment, and then continues to update it down the road. And it either builds or it doesn't. And if it builds, you run the app, and now you have that application on your Linux desktop, and it gets updated as part of all of your packages. And if it doesn't build, well, you can either troubleshoot it or you just ah, okay, I can't use that app. Uh, there's none of this like go find a deb, download the deb. There's none of this go. Find find the yeah. PPA, it's, it is, it's yeah, a totally it, much easier Python experience. Script. Yeah, run this Python script to install it. it mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I am thinking about, like, writing a few utilities that, I'm, that I use on the Mac, uh, writing Unity versions of them. And the biggest hang-up I have is, like, if I want to sell this, because, I, you know, I will, I'm evil, <laughs> um, I need it to be something where I don't have to have, like, a long support wiki on how to install it. Right, it, so that's... You know, the most elegant solution I have so far is simply shipping a Ruby or a Bash script with it. And it but I don't think Ruby's not pre-installed, so a Bash script with it that simply goes out and fetches dependencies. Um, or ship everything statically linked. 
those are some fat binaries. Yeah. <laughs> Which again, desktops, laptops, does it matter? I mean, that is the Mac model, right? Everything is 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 basically statically linked. If you're linking to the OS 10 frameworks, they're there, and you can always assume they're there. Thank you, Apple. Yeah. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah, I would. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I would wait. I think the solution will come uh, potentially. Yeah, if you want, to, if you are interested in targeting the Ubuntu desktop, it means it means waiting a while. But snappy packages are seriously going to solve a lot of this of this problem. Well, I'm uh, not even sure about like the dev toolkit I'm going to be using. Yeah, yet. yeah, that, well, there's not. Yeah, yeah, I uh, I continue to I continue to say if you're ready to take the deep uh, deep end, uh, like Azer is saying, Anagros is it's a nice way to get a very current Linux desktop where you get you get absolute modern GTK, modern GNOME, right. or you could actually pick any desktop. I go GNOME, but you could pick you could pick Mate or Cinnamon or or KDE um, or all of them. And uh, if you can change your mindset to when I install an application. Uh, I need to go, what, basically the trick is is uh, say you want to install Corbird, right? Right. You do Corbird Arch, and there will be a wiki on it. But the wikis are legitimately very good, and the areas you know are, that you need to copy and paste from are are marked as code in the wiki, so they stand out. Uh, and essentially, what the answer is is they're always in the AUR, and you can just go search the AUR for a package, and then you type that name in with your AUR manager on the command line or using their GUI app, which totally sucks. Uh, and then you have it. It's done. And as long as you switch to that philosophy instead of going to download files from the web, and I, to me, it's a much better way to do it because you just put you could put them all in one line on your command line, and boom, everything's installed. It's wonderful. Everything's installed, yeah. Just uh, it. Yeah, and then they're all getting updates too, which is just gorgeous. And you you know they're getting immediate updates because you and a lot of times in the AUR they'll you can you can you can get the stable version or you can get the Git version and literally get new updates as they put a new build up on GitHub. Uh, which is only useful when you're when you're building against something very modern. But it's very nice to choose to get the latest development stuff or to get the latest stable stuff. It's, it's a cool cool way to go. And so like that's for I, I for example when I get an Anagros installation, first thing I do open up the terminal. I uh, Packers I is my is my uh, AUR manager. So I install Chrome Google Chrome, uh, not Chromium because it comes with Chromium. I install Google Chrome and Dropbox and all these you know Skype all these applications one one command line. It's gorgeous. So if you get to that point, it is, I would say, worth experimenting with, but I wouldn't disrupt your workflow for it because if you're getting That's into a problem, a, yeah, I'm actually getting very busy again. Yeah, and if you're getting so, into a good groove, uh, yeah. I would stick with it because uh, I think Ubuntu's Honestly, as a fine desktop too. It's just I, a different way of doing it. I see a world in the summer where I finally cave and have to, you know, turn my Mac into a build machine and just get another day-to-day machine, and I have a. Feeling, especially since now they're they just upped the uh, Sputnik or the Dell XPS developer editions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now with Skylake and Thunderbolt. I, right. I I have a don't don't call it Thunderbolt unless you want to get sued. Uh, <laughs> I think they call it Thunderbolt though. Do they really? Yeah. Oh, I thought that was like an Apple like you know FireWire. I think it's thing. an Apple Intel joint, and so yeah. Okay. Yeah. Either that or a System seventy six, but I, yeah. I have a soft spot for the Dells, but. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I just, it depends what you're going for. You know, if you end up, if you want like a really great just development desktop, I would say definitely System seventy six. If you want a laptop, then I think it gets more competitive. Depends well, what kind of laptop, laptop you want too. I, I think I want a laptop, and I, you know, I will say one thing. Coming from having used Apple for a long time, it does make you kind of a picky pitch. Yeah, sure. I, sure. I'm particularly worried about trackpads. Yeah, that's a rough which, go. You know, I love the System seventy six. When I used it, I a person I used to work with had one. But that was always the problem with it. You had to base it, it just wasn't, you know, up to the Mac trackpads. Um, my old XPS 13 also wasn't up to the Mac trackpads, but I don't know what to say because I window, you know, non Macs aren't there. Um, and cost is obviously a, a thing here. If the System 76 is, you know, a couple hundred dollars cheaper, that makes it a couple hundred dollars more attractive. I've been pretty happy with my XPS 13. I would say absolutely the weakest point by far is the trackpad. Yeah. I mean, I, to, to be fair, it's bad, I, man. I, it's bad. I, I use my even my MacBook that I'm on right now. I use in clamshell mode almost all the time. Yeah, like, but I, I times, have uh, I have on all my laptops pretty much. I have Logitech MX Anywhere mice. Love those mice. Best mice. I, I'm using a, a Razer Naga 
Cause yeah, that, these if you if you want a portable if you want a portable mouse that is, I mean I, I just love these any, uh, MX anywhere's, and uh, they uh, they have a little tiny receiver so I just leave it in the USB port all the time and so I do use the trackpad. Um, they're getting better, Mike, but they're still, I mean, they're, they're just... They're still kind of garbage. Yeah. And, and obviously price. I mean, one thing I noticed is that the developer editions of the XPSs tend to be more expensive than the non-developer edition, hmm. to the point where it might make sense just to get the Windows version and wipe it. That's what I did. I did do that, and uh, I it, it's been fine. There's, but it, I've been told with the new ones there's a problem with uh, some drivers or something, that you will have a less painful experience if you just... To oh, me yeah. now, because they're because they're releasing with a cadence, I would buy. I would absolutely buy the developer edition. A for support, but B just to also say, Shit. thank you for are, thank right, you for doing this. These, yeah. Please support it. Blah, yeah. Blah, blah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Apollo trackpad is pretty good, uh, Micah. It's 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 damn good, really. It's right. it's just a little small, um, and uh, yeah, I, I just there. I can't. How do you explain that the MacBook trackpad is pretty solid? So I don't know. It's, it really is, and and I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, I, I think I'm just tired of OS ten. The difference. So the Apollo is when I'm when I can use the, when I when I when I have just the Apollo, I can use the trackpad fine. And one of the things I often do, which is tricky on these uh, trackpads, is I want to highlight a block of text in a web browser. Then I want to right click on that block of text, and then I want to go into a sub menu in the right click and click something. And that is. So tricky for a lot of these uh, trackpads. Like it's almost impossible yeah. to do that on the XPS. It's it's like a three finger claw maneuver I have to do to pull it off. On the Apollo, uh, I can do it, um, and on the MacBook, it's it's like it's no it's, problem. It's no problem. Yeah, yeah. but I don't use I don't double the Apollo. But so I always just have the Logitech mouse. Yeah. Uh, all right, Mike. Anything right. else we want to cover? We time for us to get out of here. I believe. Nope, time you have a call. For us to get out of here. All right, Mr. Yep. Dominic. Well, tell people where they can find you throughout the week. Maybe on uh, the Twitters or on the websites. Dom- DominicM.com or at Dominico on the Twits. I do like that. Uh, I like. How's your Moto 360? Did you figure out the uh, time and days that working nope, better now? It's still December 31st, 1971. <laughs> Yay for daylight savings, everybody! In fact, if daylight savings has messed you up, you can go to JupiterBroadcasting.com/calendar. We always are getting that converted to your local time zone because we stock you. No, I, I, I just have to kind of base it on your IP, I assume. Because we are watching you. We're watching you. Yeah, that's why you have to turn on your webcam. No, I'm kidding. No, go to oh. the calendar page, then go to jblive.tv. It's at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. Also, go to radio.reddit.com to submit feedback. Okay, everybody, thank you so uh, much. Uh, oh, what's that? What? Okie dokies. Okie dokies. Thank you so much for joining this week's episode of the Coda Radio Program. I'll see you back here next week. <laughs>